Good morning. I'm the head of the Change magazine paper. Now the, we come to an end of this uh, Common Good Summit. And uh, prior to listening to Jean Tirol, I'd like to ask a question. This is not a business case, but still, this is fairly close to the uh, situation in the field. Now, who should be deciding on the common good? And the major part of this uh, particular session will be devoted to the role played by the company. You know that there are various types of stake stakeholders. You get the non-NGOs. We've seen a number of them. At the rostrum, um, we also have the citizen consumer. You also have the salaried employee. You get the trade unions, the communities, the experts, the states, and all of that. And you also have the company. So we are very happy to have three different gazes, or three different ways of looking at this, with Mathia de Ventripeau, who has just joined us who's at a distance from Belgium because he is the professor of economics at the University, Free University of Belgium. And he has worked a lot uh, on uh, w with Jean Tirol, particularly on these uh, issues of the role played by the company. We also have Melanie, Melanie Tisserand. She's representing what we usually call the small and medium-sized companies are very small companies with uh, and uh, so you're about 3,000 of them um, or about 6,000 I'm sorry congratulations so these are this is the very center of the young uh, uh, managing directors uh, it's an association which has pushed forward a number of thinking about uh, about the role of companies and the uh, heads of these uh, companies uh, for the evolution of society. And uh, also, Eric Fro, you are the head of Pierre Fabre, a major company, um, because you have a, a revenue of about 3 billion euros. And most of your activities are uh, carried out abroad. And it's very much anchored as well in the uh, territory. And I think this is one of the major French companies who's at office, um, well, we have a number of them in Toulouse, but the, the head office is uh, located not in Paris or in the Parisian area. So I'd like to start with you, actually, because Pierre Fabre, beyond this particular specificity, you've got something else. You have a very peculiar statute, and I'd like, like to start on this because Pierre Fabre is part of the very rare major French companies uh, who are not uh, we're not talking about cooperatives, but it's not listed, or it's not such a capitalistic company. And maybe you could say a few words about the structure and how Mr. Pierre Fab uh, designed for the future the structure of the capital of the company. And this is a specificity for this company, actually. Yes, good morning. Well, Pierre Fab has got a major stakeholder, which is a public fund. Uh, uh, he's got 86% of the uh, the funds of the company. It's uh, especially 10% uh, is, is devoted to the uh, employees, and we have a self-control, so we can uh, feed uh, the part of the uh, salaried employees. This was designed by Mr. Pierre Fab at the end of the 90s because he created the foundation in 1998, and it was recognized as a public, uh, of, uh, as a, it's a humanitarian uh, company, uh, and as a major stakeholder in the company, whenever the board uh, decides uh, to um, grant dividends, uh, pay out dividends, 86% will go to humanitarian causes that have no relation to the company and that are carried out essentially in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. It's a very specific um, feature. Uh, additionally, um, we'll have to look at the practical case, which is very interesting, which is just uh, squaring with our topic. So um, I think uh, I think this is a statute. We'll have to ask Matthias for the validation of this structure, but I think it's fairly adapted to the decision making or to the steering of the common good. Now, is that a model that could be duplicated? 
because uh, there aren't so many of them. There's a, there's a few of them. There's Velux, I think, there's Rolex. They've got that type of uh, structure, legal structure or financial structure. Are there any other examples? And do you try to proselyte this particular system to while it is being developed? I think it's a little bit curious that it should be done so lately, but uh, the legal modification dates back from 2005, but uh, 2005, it's fairly old, but then we have three major companies that are moving to this particular type of statutes, including the founders who have announced that with their children, they've decided that their children do not deserve all the funds of the company, and it will be a foundation that will inherit, and because uh, under French law, you need to have a family agreement, what we call the hereditary reserve in France, and this is being developed. But of course, we, four companies have started a lot in France, of course, but we can see the positive side. It's a model which is ongoing, it is on the shelf, and it's available for any company. It's not specific to Pierre Faber. Only Melanie, um, there are other types of statutes. We know the the uh, anonymous uh, companies or private companies, but there are plenty of other statutes that have been developing um, over the last years, uh, taking up some very old uh, structures. Now, among your know, 6,000 companies that subscribe to you, to you, have they tested new uh, uh, statutes? And then afterwards, we'll look at the organization of the companies. But then from a statutory point of view, we talked a lot about with the covenant mm, uh, law or act, uh, about the emissions. So what is your gaze on that? Because in the world of the small companies, what is the situation? Well, definitely, prior to answering your question, I just would like to uh, focus a little bit on the CG day. Well, these are 6,000 companies uh, who, well, some master creator of that particular structure, uh, gathered together 100 bosses to think about the company differently. In 1938, we had the major strikes of 1936. There was a social climate which was highly explosive, and John Mersch decided with his 100 buses, that the young buses, that the that the buses wouldn't be what it used to be because he was he could not recognize himself in it. So I think it's very important to make this particular focus because these are our roots, and our roots have got to be defended today in all the things that we are going to test in this so-called. Now, in the second part, we'll be defining uh, who decides on the common good, but then talking about the company. Right. I think it is, it is important for me to understand that the company uh, is not going to decide on the common good. The, 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 this is only a tool to implement what has been decided upstream uh, regarding the, the commons so the communes. In other words, how we do we implement the needs of the commune in our uh, companies? How do we produce differently and so on and so forth? This is just in between, um, in, as an, uh, this is just one way of uh, implementing this. So we can have a structure which can be uh, flexible. Uh, well, yes. Well, so yes and no. Where are the who's paying out the dividends? You know, it's uh, it's different from a listed company, or uh, or where the capital is uh, um, may, is held by a public foundation. Well, we are not listed because 95 percent of the uh, of our companies are SMEs, mm, or very small companies. So we are included in the value chain of the major groups, that's for sure, but still we are SMEs. Uh, so the companies from the so-called CHG day uh, will be based on capital, uh, capitalistic model, as we know, uh, like, like the private uh, companies. Uh, uh, and we also ha um, uh, we have also the OSS uh, companies. Uh, resist. One of the specificity of that particular company is that we are talking about social claims, the way we share value, so the compensation, the best compensation cannot be 10 times more than the minimum wages. So that excludes de facto many people, because in the very high companies, 
including the state companies, we have a, a proportion which is much higher than that. So I'd like to have Mer Merci Mathias. Thank you for uh, thank you, Matthias, for joining us. Uh, a word, maybe, on or two questions. Um, first of all, regarding the statutes, uh, I think this is it important or not, and what is your own vision at the European level? What is your vision of the way things are evolving? We all know the Covenant Act in France, but I'm sure, very briefly, could you say a few words about that? And then, relative to what uh, Melanie was saying, do you agree that when we say that it's not a company, but it's those who are holding it who should be uh, wearing or bearing the common good? If I have summed it up well. Well, well. Thank you for having me, and it's. Uh, for, uh, I'm very sorry not to be able to attend physically uh, to your conference. However, relative to your questions, I'd like to say that when we talk about the company uh, statutes, it may be important, but it's not the only thing that counts, and that relates to the second part of your question because we have a model. Uh, of, of companies where the shareholders uh, are holding the company and they are running and they are um, owners, but as owners as, and being a, and the owner and the controller is not the same thing because for the last four decades uh, uh, associated with Mr. Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, we've, we've had the development of the uh, shareholding uh, dominance and this is very much associated with the shareholders and this can be seen very greatly in uh, in the compensation of the top management now to give you an example one sector where the shareholder can be a problem and we've seen it with the financial crisis is the banking sector because there because it's such an important sector there are so much debt, so you can take too much risks. And we have managed, following this major crisis, to limit in Europe the variable compensation to 200% of the fixed compensation. And the first thing that the English did when they left Europe was to abandon this, so that you get companies um, so the, the buses in these companies have one million uh, as a major part of their wage. So this, you have this problem of what goes on within the company. And from this point of view, I think it is. Is it? Uh, we're doing our best, but the uh, sound is uh, pretty bad, actually. <laughs> uh, not easy to translate. So, uh, well, uh, would you say, uh, would you say that uh, the company, as a moral entity, uh, has got responsibility, uh, or is it just a group of uh, stakeholders? Answer. The company has to be guided uh, by uh, regulations, also thanks to the uh, in-house organization, especially in some sectors for which the market is not doing well, and uh, markets on which uh, uh, shareholding would be a problem. Let me go back to you. Uh, you are working in a highly competitive sector with large-sized groups and companies quoted, listed on the stock exchange, which uh, may have other priorities. So, may I ask? On a daily basis, would you say that your status is a problem or not? The fact of not having shareholders uh, can be regarded as a constraint or 
I'm saying wrong. The only constraint is that because we are not listed on the stock exchange, we cannot fund it by markets. So uh, the uh, f uh, uh, that's why uh, maybe a hitch a problem. And uh, since we do need funding, uh, especially in, uh, for R&D, uh, uh, industrial development, patent acquisitions, up to 300 million in a, a year. We can only have uh, them thanks to our uh, own resources, thanks to the uh, uh, resources generated by the group ourselves. May, uh, it's a, it may be a constraint, of course, but but when it comes to redistribution along the lines of De Gaulle tradition, the former French president De Gaulle, uh, uh, if we look at this uh, redistribution aspect, we have got a, a competitive edge, so to speak. Our shareholders will be less greedy than others in other companies which can be which may be listed on the stock exchange our fund foundation does get committed over three year periods and when we launch uh, uh, we start a program especially in south asia and africa uh, we have good visibility with our partners, NGOs, associations, non-profit organizations or states. So our moral duty is to make it possible for our shareholder to have this good visibility. So this may be tricky at some stage. Yet, yet, the advantage is that we are guided by this will to, to, to work uh, to the benefit of common good and it gives us the uh, a strong capacity to invest in uh, environments in which uh, uh, in an environment in which investments play a major part let's now uh, get a little bit more downscale so to speak uh, let uh, but let's go uh, into the details we did mention the, this distribution one third one third one third now, what about the recommendations made with uh, your members, made to your members, sorry, and to the various players, taking uh, all things being considered? Well, well. There are contradictory interests, of course, in very small size companies or small sized companies. In financial interests are not that contradictory, actually. But there is a fundamental tenet when mentioning, uh, when talking of uh, stakeholders and players. We mean uh, co-workers, employees, shareholders, but also uh, suppliers, customers, and 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 it really matters. And the way the way we do integrate the planet in our uh, set mindset. How do we make decisions nowadays? Well, we must take the human beings into account, but we must not ignore the impact of human activity of our human activity on the environment. Otherwise, if we don't do so, we are going to endanger our living conditions on Earth and our children's living condition on Earth too. And uh, uh, our uh, way of doing things can be discussed, can be criticized too. But we must really be aware of this. Other, uh, otherwise, uh, our future is in danger. And when uh, discussing go common good, we must uh, take into account the living space in which we are uh, born and w in which we are living. It's one of the uh, central key issues we are discussing, addressing uh, at uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, city uh, at our level in uh, our association. How can the planet? How can the planet become a real player? If I'm right, you launch a, a, on an initiative on uh, uh, the Green Index. And how can you say a few words on this and how you can become a leader in this respect? Well, there are two different uh, sides to the question. Uh, the stakeholders, players first. Uh, when you want to have a good governance, you need to have external stakeholders, environmental associations, chemists associations, amongst others, who have access to the life of the company, to the accounts, and to contribute to writing the integrated report, otherwise called the CSR report, transmitted to the auditors, checking the accounts and the results of the company. Now, uh, you also you did it uh, to our uh, main major goal, making products and services available to our uh, clients. And in 2021, Pierre Fabre decided to set up to, together with AFNOR, an uh, independent entity, a method to, to, to calculate uh, the green index, the green impact index, including 20 criteria defining the societal environmental impact of our activities, including good transport. This is accessible uh, to, to all uh, consumers online. And uh, it's a kind of UCA system, yes, that is. Uh, it has been first used in-house to improve uh, our way of doing things. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, when you use uh, several uh, mixes of ingredients, uh, you, you, can get, you have a final score. And by having this green index, uh, we did really upgrade the results. And after checking this measure in in house, and after checking its feasibility and its value, we decided to check it externally, and we will make it more official, so to speak. And. Uh, uh, and we will be working with uh, other entities, 10 large sized entities, to get an AFNOR, AFNOR, AFNOR which is an independent uh, uh, entity. Um, uh, and we will uh, try and have an AFNOR record or uh, with called in, in France AFNOR spec. Uh, it's a kind of ranking. Uh, you mentioned the one-third, one-third, one-third uh, distribution. Easy to remember, of course. Uh, but uh, I think this uh, was used by Mr. Dasso. And uh, uh, where should we stop in taking uh, into account all the uh, various uh, interests. Well, where should we stop? What is key? This exam, the one third, one third, one third distribution is quite valuable, and it clearly points to the fact that shareholders were less greedy in the past than what they are now, and uh, there are now a lot of uh, excess uh, uh, demands by shareholders, and we should uh, strike a, a better balance. But the devil uh, is uh, quite uh, is far too often in the details. I think it's worthwhile uh, highlighting the uh, the solvency results uh, and uh, 
uh, profitability results too. And uh, it can, by the way, help consumers to make their choices. So I, I do agree on this, but, but there is a danger lying there uh, because it's not easy uh, uh, to do it uh, by adding by adding this new parameter feature uh, the common good to planet or the, the interest for the planet not easy to define the interest for the planet and uh, and uh, uh, and some people have even suggested uh, to replace uh, ESG, the acronym ESG, environment, etc., uh, etc., et with E for environment as a whole. Uh, so let's not fall into these uh, traps. Uh, let's avoid all these pitfalls. And uh, let's make sure, first and foremost, that. Uh, any, all the bodies, entities, organizations aiming at common good are doing things properly. Let's take the example of Bill Gates, uh, who is interested in health issues, could be a member of some pharmaceutical companies, and that would be very helpful. I also think that having uh, uh, workers' representatives on the board, as it's a case in Germany, uh, something they don't really like at all in the U.S., might be uh, might be beneficial. So let's look at things uh, uh, concretely, in a concrete manner, in a down-to-earth mode. I think that business people are like you, like me. Uh, they are in favor of ethics, but uh, there is an existing system, and it's up to the system to guide everyone, all the company members, uh, all the workers, uh, to, 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 to head in the right direction. Not to round up this. Uh, uh, session, and you can of course ask questions thanks to the uh, QR code, which is the, uh, which has already been displayed or which is going to be displayed on the screen. Uh, I haven't got too many expectations or too high expectations uh, uh, concerning uh, companies. There is a huge amount of new standards, norms. Large size companies have got their own legal department, they have got their advisors, uh, consultants, they know about the uh, green norm standards, details, and uh, so new norms are going to be uh, released. Uh, a new law uh, entitled Full Employment uh, Law is going to be passed. Uh, there has been an agreement with the trade unions on some aspects uh, of this uh, law, and uh, uh, this is this will become obligatory for all companies with more than ten people on the payroll. So, is that the right approach? I mean, because there are so many standards, norms, etc., and uh, uh, so. What about the right balance between ethics and compliance? Well, all you members are ethical, aren't they? And compliant, of course. Well, I am a chartered accountant, that's my job. So I know about uh, norms, uh, standards, and the like. But there is a real issue there, too many, perhaps, to, perhaps too many obligations for companies. Talking about uh, value sharing, When we ask our members whether they have already introduced uh, uh, measures on uh, value sharing, bonuses, uh, etc., uh, uh, they answer, but we, it has already been done. We haven't been waiting for you to come and ask. 
and 6,000 companies which are members of uh, CGD uh, out of uh, several millions, that's not enough. So we will have to entice uh, those who haven't been ready so far uh, to, 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 to uh, change gear. And, uh, and I must say that uh, when building a, a format or a platform together uh, with the uh, salaried workers and, of course, uh, the top management, And despite the fact that we are not sufficiently successful, I think we can really welcome these new agreements in this respect. Going back to Pierre Fabre, since your, sal your workers, sal salaried workers, uh, have uh, are part of the ca capital, what? Is there anything you can say on value share? I would, say, if I were a trade unionist, I would say uh, what is what would be best is uh, an increase in wages and salaries. I think this can be obtained thanks to uh, uh, in-house social dialogue. Of course, there are. You have, we have got the salaries, bonuses, etc., and social dialogue makes it possible to make decisions with the social partners. When inflation is high, there is more pressure on the salary. That's obvious. This should be solved at company level. To go back to what you said on norms. Uh, they are quite demanding. There are many, many norms and drugs. Let's not forget uh, the uh, competitive age of some countries to the detriment of others. And uh, France is really uh, bidding and bidding very high when it comes to norms. And it's uh, rather weak when it comes to uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, it's rather doing uh, poorly when it comes to trade exchanges and trade deficit, as you know. And uh, we have. We must not forget about uh, the uh, perennity of companies and. Uh, and this uh, is quite essential to look uh, into the future and to envisage uh, the future of all our companies. Matthias, you very know the European Commission. Would you say that uh, uh, you have uh, some index on uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, norms and standards uh, uh, since we are now including uh, the environmental uh, uh, factors? And, would, so what we, and what about value sharing? Yesterday, we heard of inflation with the uh, Banque de France uh, high governor and uh, discussed uh, the issue of uh, wages increase. Uh, what, what is your point of view? Do you think that wages increase can be, with wages increase, the salaried workers much must, can be better off than with uh, uh, premiums or bonuses? I'm not repeating the question. Uh, I've just worded the speaker is saying. Well, more and more norms. Well, it's a fact in Europe, of course, but elsewhere too. Bal uh, two was trickier than Bal one. Basel two was uh, sorry more intricate than Basel one, and it will be even worse and more complex with Basel three. Why so? It's because each entity, each company, uh, each large size company, or 
each uh, uh, venture, joint venture, business, etc., etc., uh, uh, wants uh, things differently. So some things could be done, but uh, do not please uh, large sized companies, especially international groups. And uh, the issue of uh, value sharing. Uh, between capital and work uh, has been addressed, especially in the States. Uh, many works have, many studies have been carried out on this topic. And uh, is the solution wages increase or uh, more bonuses or uh, enhanced participation, financial participation? Difficult to say. Let's go back to Germany. In Germany, workers in large size companies and in medium sized companies uh, are rather well protected. Uh, Whereas uh, the workers working in the small-sized companies uh, are not protected at all. And there is a strong inequality there. So, I mean, the situation may differ according to, 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 to the type of company. So, what do we need? We do need specific mechanisms which ensure some level of equity at macroeconomic uh, level and social regulation has to focus on fairness and equality. We did write a paper on this uh, score together with Jean Tirole, stating that competition in itself was not an issue, but uh, there could be uh, uh, drifts uh, due to the behavior of some companies. Melanie, how do you react to something we see these days? That is the difference between the salaried workers in small-sized companies and large-sized companies. In the past, we had the difference and the gap between the blue colors and the white colors. Now it seems to be different. There seems to be a difference uh, between the workers in large size companies and in very small or small size companies. Is it something you're addressing, you are witnessing, or people are so fantastic with you that are even better off than in large size companies? Well, I have to say, what shall I say? There is a new trend. Our co-workers are looking for meaning for meaning in their job, in their work. And we add to the meaning which and and making our workers loyal is not easy. It's one of the major challenges experienced by a very small and small size companies these days. And uh, this really means thinking about it before hiring someone. We are, we are discussing the four day week uh, with the four day working week. But uh, the, the Pondian point is having a desirable company for workers to join. So the, the companies are changing and the requirements of the new generations and are not the same as those of previous generations. Could you confirm this? Isn't that a factor 
What about recruitment? Do you have any difficulties? Should we change the models in order to be attractive from this point of view? Well, you took, lo talked about desirability and the company uh, regarding, uh, regarding the mar labor market. If you are in a, in a period where the uh, where employment is uh, greater, they can better choose. Uh, so there are, you should have competitive um, offers. So you should also try to give some meaning. And you should bring the uh, collaborators on board with a certain raison d'etre uh, for the company so that they can progress. And I think that any company can provide that. It will be done through social actions that will be carried out. We mobilized our collaborators to do some uh, um, expeditions towards the U Ukrainian populations during the start, uh, from the start of the war. And then uh, I think it enables us to bring some additional value to the company and bring some value cohesion. Uh, what we uh, learned from COVID is a separation of people and working from a distance means you cannot work within a team, so you should try to find this back. And um, a company like Pierre Fab, we have some populations of salaried workers that are very different. Out of 6,000 collaborators, 2,500 work in the industry and logistics, that's about 40 percent. Now, compared to our competitors, it's only 10 percent of their celebrity workers working in this particular sector. But we produce 90 percent of what we are doing in France, uh, and uh, and 90 percent is pr produced in France. Again, we are handling different um, populations like researchers at the Cancer Pole, and also we have some commercial reps on the road, and we also have some collaborators in the plants, in the logistics centers, so they have a different way of uh, uh, working. and. Um, and that makes it, the job uh, complex and uh, exhilarating because we create a community through this and the, and the desirability issue is not the same according to the various populations concerned. And we have a question now, it's just a finding, what about why should we res resume this to a matter of compensation when we talk about uh, a common good? Isn't that value creation? Which is not only financial. I think we should add on that because. Uh, so what? Uh, what about profits? Is it a big word? Uh, a buzz? Because if we want to share value, you have to create it. And again, do you think that uh, among your uh, uh, subscribers, it's not part of the objective? So, what about the companies? Are they uh, progressively? becoming NGOs, how, how far can we go in this particular direction? Yes, I believe that the question is extremely pertinent because uh, the question behind that is what do we count? We count monies, right? Uh, it would be good to try and find something else. Should we count the rest, uh, the re remaining part, the well-being in our company? And what we count, not only the financial side, how can it be retranscribed into the accounts? And I'm sure that if we started to count differently, uh, then the accounts of the companies which have a negative impact on the ecosystem uh, would become negative. They won't find uh, shareholders uh, to uh, support them. And this is what is important. What should we count? And uh, I think that we are right in the, in the right place. Uh, we have to question the economists and the researchers on what sort of new accounting uh, practice could be proposed to the companies so that they take into account all these uh, criteria like the social and the environmental. Yes, definitely. And I think, well, uh, you have the care method, right. But. Uh, how can you become eco-responsible? How can you experiment it? What we would like to do, we would like to uh, do that, actually. There are certain major companies that, that buy the, the uh, publicity or advertising at the end of their fiscal year. They communicate a number of figures like a major maritime uh, uh, um, uh, company. But they don't say anything about the ex ex except for the net uh, result. Isn't that a bit excessive? Would you assume, would you support the creation of financial value? Is it a, 
something which is uh, uh, not very important uh, because it, you, know, you can be c considered as a criminal if you are making money. Don't you think we go too far? And uh, we'll come back with Mathias Saint Jean on this uh, p particular uh, ethics, like creating financial value. Now, don't you think that we haven't got a bit too far in that particular direction? Well, there's no investment if there's no profits and there's no progress. And progress is economic, but it can also be environmental, societal, and it's a collective in a certain way. So I believe that the financial value creation is absolutely essential, but what do you make of it? And I think that there you have various types of metrics that then can be considered. I can understand what you've been saying about the compensations. If we take the right side of things, it may obs appear obscure, like a forest, there are so many things inside. So, but it, but but exa for example, what we call the green mission within the company five years ago. That's what we started. These are objectives about the environmental quality. So we looked at the Paris Accords, and uh, then we saw at the scale of the company what it could mean in terms of energy consumption or uh, carbon emission or waste uh, and uh, water consumption. So all these uh, metrics uh, and giving us a certain trajectory. And this is our own uh, compass. And I'm quite, I can tell you that this compass is looked by a board just like the financial performance. And I think it is very interesting because the stakeholders I was referring to and they are contributing to the integrated report. They look at this with the same accurate accuracy. It seems a little bit complex because you take some agree agreements at the international level, but can you do at local level with a small company in a certain way? So it's possible to do that and it gives us this compass, which is an additional uh, element to the uh, financial uh, uh, criteria. And it can be followed. It can be described in many ways. It can be done and rolled out in different uh, contexts. We have a lot of expertise in France. In, we have many startups working on this and the data. And what is important before launching into this is to generate a lot of data about the carbon production because you can start really to make efforts if you, you only have measured accurately. And so, so that brings back to what Melanie was saying about uh, accountancy, and this is the way we're going to progress. Well, thank you greatly to all of you wholeheartedly. And so we are uh, going through the company's uh, little secrets. We talked about the um, Please do not join, uh, do not uh, leave uh, Mathias because Jean Thiel is working on this particular topic uh, with the Toulouse School of Economic Teams. So we'll be coming back into the metrics to see how we can compute all these uh, particular demands and uh, requirements that are a little bit contradictory. Thank you to you too, and I'd like Mr. Stirol to join us on the restaurant, please. Mm -hmm.